Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The title of this video is going to frustrate a lot of people before I even start talking about the subject. But please remember, if we want the truth we need to scrutinise the popular alternative ideas as much as we do the mainstream view. Before I make a long and detailed video about the Geology of the Sphinx Part 2, I thought it would be a good idea to pluck one specific subject out and make it as a standalone video, because it provides very important information in our quest for the true history of the Giza Plateau, and asks some questions that are very hard to answer. Firstly, even though many geologists completely disagree, in my opinion the Sphinx enclosure does show signs of water erosion. But the debate by geologists and Egyptologists is whether or not this erosion is 7 to 10,000 years old, whether it's pre-dynastic, early dynastic, or if it's actually indicative that the Sphinx was carved in the 4th dynasty by Khufu, Jedefere or Khafre. Now, the geological weathering and erosion at the Great Sphinx is a complex field of study. It isn't as simple as wind and rain as is often presented. It's dependent on the rock type. It's dependent on the intense chemical weathering of the bedrock and natural fractures prior to the carving of the Sphinx, the upward wicking of the salty groundwater before the Sphinx was carved, surface runoff, subsurface water flow and haloclasty, all of which are detailed in a recent video on the channel World of Antiquity, which I've linked below. As stated, most geologists, yes, most of them, actually say there is no evidence of water erosion at the Sphinx enclosure. They say that this is not water erosion, and their arguments are actually very fair and scientifically on point. Just because we've seen a popular TV show or YouTube video, it doesn't mean that this is water erosion. It is simply one interpretation, and I personally think that water is just one of many processes that took place. Geology is a dynamic subject. It's not as simple as wind versus water erosion. This is too simplistic and unrealistic, and most geologists would agree. All of the different geological processes have had an effect on the Sphinx we see today, and we are not simply looking at a monument affected by rainwater and wind erosion. The Member 2 limestone that makes up the bulk of the body of the Great Sphinx, as well as the walls of the enclosure, is incredibly soft due to being weathered way before the Sphinx was even carved from the bedrock. The idea that rainwater erosion dates the Sphinx to 7 to 10,000 BC is so popular, and so many alternative researchers consider this to be a fact without looking into it themselves. Ask yourself, if the Sphinx is mainly affected by rainwater erosion, why is there far less water-induced erosion on the Sphinx than the enclosure walls? Why do some parts show no water erosion at all? I'm not even convinced there is any on the body of the Sphinx, yet surely we should see strong evidence on the monument itself if it was affected by thousands of years of rainfall. The fact is, we don't. We see a little, but not a lot. Even on photos where the masonry is removed, masonry that would have preserved the body in dynastic history, we don't see much evidence of rain erosion. You can see so many videos on YouTube that point out the water erosion on the Sphinx enclosure wall, saying that this makes the Sphinx 10,000 or even 50,000 years old. But it's really not a proven fact. Far from it. And many people, including me in the past, have blindly jumped on a popular bandwagon without any attempt to even understand it. Author Stephen Mailer says the Sphinx is 54,000 years old, which, in my opinion, is a baseless date with no science or archaeology to underpin it. And according to this tradition, she is the oldest statue on our planet that we know of now. There may be things older, but that her date is 54,000 years. 54,000 years, not 4,500, like Zahir Was will tell you. I'll stick my neck out and say that such an ancient date is completely wrong. Many also fail to point out that the south and western walls of the Sphinx enclosure were never vertical. Experts have shown that originally they were cut at an angle, which means there isn't loads more weathering at the top of the western wall compared to the bottom. It's just that the wall was never vertically cut, 
I don't mind who is right and who is wrong. I'm not selling a book or pushing a theory to sell out a tour or lecture. I'm basing my opinions on evidence, and I'll only make an assumption if it's likely and logical, and there is no evidence available. I'm actually quite surprised that most people are willing to accept a popular theory, all because there is a popular interpretation of these features by one geologist. Yet most geologists completely disagree. Sadly, for the study of ancient Egypt, these geologists are not given a popular platform to reach a wide audience. So, their opinion goes unheard. Alternative researchers are meant to scrutinise accepted research to find the truth, but it too often appears to be selective. People will scrutinise pyramid radiocarbon dates because these dates align with Egyptology, commenting how unreliable the dating method is. This is all because they want the pyramids to be much older, because many people have this unfounded preconception, and many work hard to deny the evidence because it doesn't fit with their ideology. Yet people never scrutinise the same radiocarbon dating techniques for Gebekli Tepe, and that's because the date ranges are older than what was expected. I don't think I've ever seen any comment on a Gebekli Tepe video complaining that radiocarbon dating is a flawed method. Nobody is ever commenting, no, Gebekli Tepe must be much younger, because there's no evidence that people here had these skills in those times. Radiocarbon dating is flawed. I would say, don't believe something just because it's a popular opinion, mainstream or alternative. In fact, it's the popular opinions that need to be scrutinised the most, to really see if they hold weight. Is the Great Sphinx really 7 to 10,000 years old? Was it really strongly affected by hundreds or thousands of years of prolonged rainfall? Personally, I don't think so. And there are many reasons to think this if you spend some time to read around the subject and read the very detailed reports by opposing geologists. Just because you see what could be water erosion at a specific location on the Sphinx enclosure doesn't mean that's hard evidence that the entire monument was affected by pre-Sahara rainfall. It just means there is one interpretation of the features we see. For example, this ancient fracture predates the carving of the Great Sphinx. Yet, geologically speaking, it's very angular, and has not been affected by any rainfall erosion. If it had, it would be more rounded in nature. This is certainly not a rainfall eroded fracture, but if the Sphinx was carved 7 to 10,000 years ago, we would expect it to look very different due to the amount of rain that would have pummeled this very soft Member 2 limestone. As well as physical observations of a lack of water erosion on the Sphinx itself, there are also the results from surface luminescence dating from the Sphinx and Valley Temples. The former and possibly the latter were made from blocks quarried from around the Sphinx. And this dating method firmly places both structures between the early dynastic and old kingdom periods. Then we have the fact that the bedrock ramp that the Khafre Causeway was built on forms the southern enclosure wall of the Great Sphinx. This is the sole reason the southern wall of the Sphinx is orientated at this strange angle, and does not follow the cardinal directions. It's obvious that the enclosure that the Sphinx sits inside was quarried right up to this causeway. This doesn't make a lot of sense unless there was a bedrock ramp or walkway already there, or maybe it could be because the causeway to the Khafre Pyramid was already there. We can't discount either of these interpretations, but we can say that there was a linear feature here before the Sphinx was created, because the enclosure was cut up to it, giving it its irregular southern wall. The main argument for a far more ancient Sphinx monument comes from the seismic surveys that I discussed in a recent video. Surveys that do seem far from conclusive. A sentiment shared by many professional independent geologists. And, with a master's degree in geology, I was left with a number of questions that I still can't find answers for. Away from geophysics, and of course the other main piece of evidence for a far more ancient Sphinx is the form of the western enclosure wall and the western third of the southern enclosure wall. Both are clearly far more eroded than the Sphinx itself, and also any other part of the Sphinx enclosure. 
these areas do look to be eroded by water. And although at least three qualified independent geologists disagree that this is water erosion, I do tend to agree with Colin Reader and Robert Schock that this is the case. You can see how the beds are rounded and how the natural fractures have been turned into gullies. This isn't seen on the western two thirds of the southern enclosure wall, and it's not seen on the Sphinx Monument itself. Water does look to have run down these walls, forming the profile we see, which seems to have happened most of all in the southwestern corner of the enclosure. The erosion here is especially deep. This erosion could be from surface runoff water, and this interpretation is a key piece of evidence for the Sphinx being 7 to 10,000 years old, because that was when there was prolonged rainfall at Giza in prehistory. But it is a clear misconception that you need prolonged sustained pre-Sahara rainfall to create the erosion of the soft member 2 limestone. The violent monsoonal rainstorms that happened in dynastic history, especially in the later phases of the Old Kingdom, can explain it because this isn't rainfall erosion, it's surface runoff erosion. Water running off the Giza Plateau and avalanching into the Sphinx enclosure. If the Sphinx monument and the entirety of the Sphinx enclosure showed clear, obvious, deep and well-defined rainfall erosion, then yes. It was likely carved when rainfall was more persistent and continuously beating down on the Giza Plateau. But we don't see this. We see a zone of runoff erosion at a specific location on the walls of the enclosure, and the poor quality of the Member 2 limestone together with the climate in early dynastic times can explain it. What we have to do is somehow date the runoff erosion, and then we can date the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure. But obviously, you can't specifically date the erosion of the bedrock. Or can you? Well, Jean-Pierre Houdin believes there might be a way, and that is through the study of the Giza topography. Now, this rabbit hole of study was actually somewhat fascinating because I never expected the results. That ironically, it could well be the so-called pre-Sahara water weathering that actually dates the carving and creation of the Sphinx enclosure to the 4th dynasty. Yep, I was as shocked as anyone, but this original idea put forward by Houdan, once published many years ago on a website that has since disappeared, puts forward the evidence that I do find very hard to argue with. So, let's take a closer look at the arguments by Houdan. Here is a topographical map of the Giza Plateau, and, as you can see, it looks like a kind of inverted oyster shell. When Giza was nothing more than a lifeless plain, the rainwater runoff would have followed the natural topographic slope of the land, as shown in this diagram by Houdan. If the Sphinx already existed, due to the topography, it was very much in the firing line of large volumes of surface runoff water, with most of it running in from the northwest before ending up in the bed of the Nile. Of course, some of it would go straight into the porous limestone, but if the volume of rain that fell on the plateau was more than could be absorbed by the bedrock, you would end up with runoff water that would follow the natural topography, picking up speed as the land got steeper. No pyramids or mastaba fields would be barriers against the flow of water, and no quarries could redirect the flow. Water would cascade across the plateau to the lowlands, before reaching the River Nile. So, if this is the natural topography, and if the Sphinx enclosure was built 7 to 10,000 years ago, before the quarries were dug and the pyramids were built, we should see the bulk of the runoff erosion on the north, west and northwestern sides of the Sphinx enclosure. There should be next to no runoff on the southern wall, because that would simply defy gravity. Any surface water to the south of the Sphinx enclosure would continue to run south or southeast there would be no barrier or obstacle, and water can't flow uphill. Therefore, the southern enclosure wall should not show surface runoff erosion. What we see in real life is that, if the Sphinx was carved thousands of years before the other structures at Giza, then the monument has defied the laws of physics, with the majority of the erosion happening in the southwest corner of the enclosure, including about a third of the southern enclosure wall. And, as I've said, this goes against the natural Giza topography, 
The only viable way to explain this is if the surface run of erosion was dictated by man-made activity on the plateau. If the pyramids, mastaba fields, cafe causeway and quarries were not there, we would see a totally different erosion pattern on the Sphinx enclosure. Two parameters that proponents of the ancient rainwater erosion hypothesis often forget are the original topography of Giza and what would happen to the topography when the quarries were dug and the pyramid complexes were built. These are two of the key factors we must consider. Let's look at this in more detail. I'm in agreement with Jean-Pierre Houdin that the linear piece of bedrock that the Cafre Causeway was built on was the first main feature on the Giza Plateau, used at the beginning of the Great Pyramid Project as a construction ramp. It wasn't a structure as such, just a strip of bedrock that was left intact by the workers as they quarried either side of it. Therefore, it did have a function in the time of Khufu. It was purposefully left. It was also there before the Sphinx, because, as stated, the bedrock ramp forms the southern wall of the enclosure. Geologist Colin Reader also believes that this bedrock ramp was here first of all, due to the fact that the Sphinx enclosure is quarried right up to it. Although, he puts forward the idea that it could be an early dynastic ceremonial walkway, part of an older symbolic sun-worshipping landscape. But evidence indicates that this ancient bedrock ramp could have been used in the construction of the Great Pyramid, due to the quarrying either side of it. And then, in time, with the addition of large amounts of masonry, creating walls and a roof, it would go on to become the Cafre Causeway. As Houdin explains, for Khufu's architects, it was a way to exploit the topography to get stone from the harbour in front of the Sphinx to the higher echelons of the Great Pyramid without having to build enormous ramps. The architects simply exploited the natural topography. It's hard to argue with this evidence and logic. Of course, Reader says it was once an ancient ceremonial walkway that was left by Khufu, and that is the reason he quarried either side of it. But even if this is the case, Khufu could have still used the walkway to transport stone. Here is Houdan's model for how Giza would have looked when the Great Pyramid was complete. Again, the fact that quarries are located north and south of the Cafre Causeway is clear evidence that the bedrock under the causeway was important. The builders left this strip of bedrock for good reason. As you can see on this image, Houdan says that when the Great Pyramid was built, or just after, either during the reign of Khufu or Jadefre, the Sphinx was also carved. And before you dismiss the idea, he does put forward a very good argument. You can see in this photograph how the Great Pyramid and the Queen's Pyramids, as well as the Mastabas not in view, would, to an extent, form a runoff barrier, limiting the volume of water that could reach the Sphinx from the north and northwest. As well as the actual building of the Great Pyramid funerary complex, the natural topography of Giza was also altered in two main ways. Firstly, the bedrock construction ramp, the strip of land that wasn't quarried, left a linear topographic high. And secondly, the main quarries either side of the ramp left man-made lows, after supplying almost all the limestone blocks for the Great Pyramid's construction. The land between the Great Pyramid and the northern quarries slopes down to the south, and, inside the quarries, the land slopes more to the southeast. The Great Pyramid, the Queen's Pyramids, the Mastaba Field, the Bedrock Construction Ramp and Quarries modified the path of rainwater runoff that came from the north and northwest of the plateau. This water would have ran south and collected inside the quarries. And because of how these quarries were dug, the water was then redirected to the southeast towards the Sphinx enclosure, eroding the western wall in a somewhat uniform manner, just as we see. This has been modelled by engineer Jean-Pierre Houdin. So, at this time when the Great Pyramid was built, the entire length of the Western Wall was being uniformly eroded when stormy conditions created flash floods at Giza, weather that was not at all uncommon in the Old Kingdom. Water would have also flowed down the bedrock ramp towards the port, as well as running off into the southern quarries before joining the Wadi and the River Nile. We do see evidence of rainwater runoff on the south side of the pre-causeway bedrock ramp. 
it's not as deep as what we see in the Sphinx enclosure, because that took the brunt of the surface runoff. But we can see that the flow of water has turned natural fissures into gullies, and has given the rock a somewhat rounded form. Colin Reader says the quarries would have simply collected the water, and would have actually stopped the surface runoff reaching the Sphinx enclosure. But even in the year 1991, during a light and sound show at the Sphinx, Egyptologist David Roll saw a torrent of water cascading into the enclosure during a rainstorm, showing that even in the modern era, surface runoff continues into the enclosure during storms, which is what you would expect due to the slope of the ground to the northwest of the Sphinx, and if the volume of rain that fell on the plateau was large. Even if a lot of the water became absorbed into the limestone in the quarries, or fell down the large bedrock cracks, eventually it would reach one of the more impermeable muddy layers that make up the limestone of Member 2, and would follow the natural dip of the limestone beds, which is towards the southeast. The groundwater would once again end up in the Sphinx enclosure. The Khufu Quarry is no barrier to both subsurface and surface water flow, and water would end up at the Sphinx enclosure one way or another. Geologist James Harrell expects that subsurface water would emerge on the western walls of the Sphinx enclosure as spring-like seepages along the bedding plains. So, work to create the Great Pyramid Funerary Complex, how the structures and quarries affected the flow of surface water, can explain the erosional features of the Sphinx enclosure. But it doesn't explain why we see the most extreme water erosion on the western end of the southern wall. Why is there any erosion here at all? This seems to defy sense, and even gravity, when you look at the topography of Giza. Any running water would simply keep running off to the south or southeast, and any subsurface water would seep out on the western wall and wouldn't be able to reach the south wall. Well, this weathering can only be explained by the building of the Cafe Causeway on top of the bedrock ramp. When this is taken into account, it seems clear that the building of both pyramid complexes influenced the erosion patterns of the Sphinx enclosure. Khafre took advantage of Khufu's construction ramp, or the more ancient ceremonial walkway for the foundations of his causeway. He also took advantage of the naturally higher ground in the west to build his pyramid, so that less blocks and more bedrock could be incorporated into the pyramid structure. He also aligned his pyramid with his father Khufu's, so that both lined up with Heliopolis, as discussed in my last video. But for Khafre to build his pyramid where he did, using the Khufu construction ramp as a bedrock for his causeway, he had to deal with the problem of the rainwater runoff, which would have run off the plateau as well as down the causeway, heading straight for his valley temple. Therefore, when constructing his causeway, Khafre built a north and south wall, which held up a roof. This exists in the archaeological record, and the walls were partially rebuilt in more modern times to show how it would have once looked. An example of such a causeway structure can be seen today at the Pyramid of Unas. The final Khafre causeway was around 10 metres wide, but the construction ramp it was built on is around 24 metres in width, therefore leaving a paved area on the northern side of the causeway. This paved area starts at the Mortuary Temple in the west, and is believed to run along the entire length of the causeway. It becomes level with the natural Giza topography at two places. A, from the Mortuary Temple to the northern quarry, and B, the area between the east side of the quarry and the northwestern corner of the Sphinx enclosure. Whether on purpose or by accident, by design the northern walkway was effectively a gutter. Rainwater runoff has even left traces, and you can see this when visiting Giza. The level of this sidewall gutter, as Houdan calls it, is slightly lower than the level of the original foundations. This gutter was only created when Khafre built the walls of his causeway. The northern causeway walls stopped water entering the causeway, and helped to channel it to the southwestern corner of the Sphinx enclosure. The flow of the surface water from the quarries met up with the water flowing down the causeway gutter, and created a bottleneck precisely in the southwest corner of the Sphinx enclosure, 
Selim Hassan said the gutter was actually cut into the causeway by Kafre, saying that there is a shallow trench cut along the northern side of the causeway of the second pyramid. Hassan was a progressive Egyptologist and explained in his meticulous work on the Sphinx that the trench is around 2 metres wide and 1.5 metres in depth and is cut into the rock and is contemporary with the 4th dynasty. He believes it was a boundary, dividing the necropolis of Khufu to that of Khafre. But combined with the north wall of the Khafre Causeway, it would have effectively channeled water to the southwestern corner of the Sphinx enclosure. Hassan explains that the trench stops abruptly at the Sphinx enclosure and explains how he believed the trench could act as a drain. And he says it is clear proof that the Sphinx was cut after the causeway. Interestingly, he also says that at some time in history, the end of the trench was filled up with great blocks of granite, maybe to try and stop water entering the back of the Sphinx enclosure, to direct it further down the causeway away from the rear of the Sphinx, and maybe that's why a large portion of the southern enclosure wall clearly looks to be water weathered. Either way, it is clear that this corner was like a junction, and during violent storms, it would have been a high energy environment with fast moving runoff water from a large part of the plateau pouring in at this point. Houdan says that this is what caused the erosion on the western end of the southern enclosure wall, and that is why we see less and less erosion from west to east on the southern enclosure wall. The Sphinx enclosure became a main outlet for the surface runoff and this is also the reason we see deep channeling on the southern side of the enclosure floor, another geological feature that's rarely mentioned. Now, if the Sphinx is the most ancient thing at Giza, we would expect the floor on the northern side of the Sphinx to be far more water eroded than the floor to the south, because the natural topography would channel water in from the northwest but when analysing the Sphinx enclosure, we see the opposite. Water runoff has strongly affected the south side of the enclosure floor, with a clear runoff channel marked here, which marries up with the extent of the runoff seen on the southern enclosure wall. In comparison, there is no such water channelling on the north side, but this should not be the case if the natural topography of Giza looks like this. It can only be explained by the pyramid quarries and the gutter or trench that was created when Khafre built his causeway. If the pyramids were built after the Sphinx, and if the weathering patterns are 7 to 10,000 years old, surely it's the northern side of the enclosure floor and the northwestern corner of the enclosure wall that should show more effects of water erosion and channeling, because the surface water would be following the natural topography of Giza. To summarise, before quarrying, the bulk of the surface runoff will be running towards the Sphinx generally from a northwest direction, but the paradox is that the bulk of the water erosion is primarily affecting the southwestern corner of the enclosure, which is at odds with the natural topography. The southern enclosure wall should show next to no signs of runoff erosion, as no water would cascade down at this point. It would simply run off to the south and southeast in a natural way. Basically, the erosion pattern would be totally different to what we see today. The only logical conclusion is that frequent rains 7 to 10,000 years ago and their associated natural runoff did not cause the water erosion at the Sphinx. It was caused by the channeling of runoff waters from a large part of the plateau because of the orientation of the pyramid quarries and the creation of a gutter. The water was all directed towards this one spot during strong rainstorms, protecting the Khafre Pyramid Complex. And please note that such rainstorms were common in the Old Kingdom, when large quantities of storm water did fall in a short space of time. This water was directed into one location, accumulating in a specific place, the western wall in the southwestern corner of the Sphinx enclosure. Even if the quarries on the north side of the Khafre Causeway did fill up with sand over time, the surface and subsurface water has to go somewhere. And, as discussed, it would eventually reach the Sphinx enclosure because of the topography of the land and also the natural dip of the rock beds.
The limestone was already weathered from chemical, salts and water erosion for thousands of years before the Sphinx was even carved, making the Member 2 limestone extremely soft and easy to erode. Today it can even crumble in your hand. Compared with the present day, such violent storms did happen more often in the Old Kingdom, and they could create the erosion patterns we see. And it also explains why we don't see the same erosion patterns on the body of the Sphinx. Some Egyptologists have estimated that from the reign of Khafre in the 4th dynasty to the reign of Tutmose IV of the 18th dynasty, the Sphinx was only exposed for around 300 years. The rest of the time it was covered with sand. But 300 years of stormwaters entering the Sphinx enclosure is more than enough to create the erosion patterns we see. If there were no pyramids at Giza, no causeway, quarries or a gutter, rainwater should run northwest to southeast. And therefore, if the Sphinx came first, I can't make any sense as to why the western half of the southern enclosure wall is arguably the most eroded part of the enclosure. In a topography undisturbed by pyramid building, quarrying and causeway making, the western and northern sides of the Sphinx enclosure should be the most heavily eroded. The northern enclosure floor would also be more deeply eroded than the south. And because the floor of the enclosure is pretty flat, the entire length of the southern wall and the southern half of the enclosure floor should be pretty well preserved. So, there you go. The Khafre Causeway, the Pyramid Quarries, and the Pyramids and Mastabas themselves have affected the direction of flow of surface rainwater runoff on the Giza Plateau. All of them affected the direction of flow, and because we know that the gutter or trench was added when the bedrock ramp was transformed into Khafre's Causeway with the addition of masonry, we can safely say that the bulk of water erosion is because of pyramid building and not before. The pattern of the erosion on the Sphinx enclosure wall cannot be used as proof that the Sphinx is 7 to 10,000 years old. It simply doesn't work. And before people give a lazy BS comment or say you're wrong, please can you go on to explain to everyone why the points raised in this video and the work by Jean-Pierre Houdin is wrong and you're right. That's simply all I ask. If this is how Giza looked when the Sphinx was carved, please explain how water would avalanche down the western half of the southern enclosure wall, without Khafre building his causeway and without the digging of pyramid quarries. Also explain why the southern enclosure wall is at this strange angle and isn't straight. You would also need to explain why the Egyptians in the Neolithic created the Sphinx on the plateau and why they then decided to purposefully channel huge amounts of water into the southwestern corner of the enclosure instead of letting it flow naturally across the land, which would protect and preserve the soft limestone of the enclosure. Were they actually trying to weather their beautiful monument? And no, the Sphinx enclosure was never a lake. No geologist believes this. The floor has enormous natural geological cracks or fissures running through it, and the limestone is porous and weathered, showing both primary porosity from the rock type and secondary porosity from ancient weathering. Furthermore, any water inside the enclosure would run out to the east, as shown by the water erosion on the floor on the south side. There was no sufficient barrier to the east of the Sphinx that could contain a sufficient volume of water. So, the water erosion does actually indicate that the Sphinx is a 4th dynasty monument, because the location and the pattern of the erosion can only really be explained if the pyramid quarries were dug and the Khafre Causeway in its associated gutter or trench was built. I have no idea how to argue these points in a logical and scientific way, and I've spent Christmas trying to figure it out. The only possible explanation is that the bedrock under the Khafre Causeway was once a pre-4th dynasty ceremonial walkway that was built on before Khafre built his causeway, that already had a gutter that channeled water into the Sphinx enclosure. But you have to ask yourself, if in those days the Sphinx was the main feature on the plateau, why would the ancient people want to direct the destructive force of stormwater towards their incredible monument? It actually makes no sense. Scientifically, Houdin's theory does work. 
Climate studies show that flash floods from intense monsoonal storms took place at Giza in the Old Kingdom quite often, and even continued right up to the New Kingdom. Flash floods can even happen in the modern age with fierce rainstorms, and even though the enclosure was likely filled up with sand by the start of the New Kingdom, it could well have been kept clean and sand-free for hundreds of years after it was built. We simply don't know. So, can the water erosion prove the Sphinx is a 4th Dynasty monument? Well, not exactly. I can't logically and scientifically counter the points put forward by Jean-Pierre Houdin. His work is logical, scientific, and, geologically speaking, based on just how weathered the soft member 2 rock was before the Sphinx was even carved it does work. All I'm saying in this video is that we can't rely on the erosion seen on the southern and western walls to help us date the Sphinx. The water erosion could have simply been formed in dynastic history. I can't see it as evidence for an older date, but that doesn't mean the Sphinx could not be an older monument. The southern wall could have just been eroded in dynastic history, or was recut by Khafre when he built his causeway. In fact, Colin Reader has shown that it does appear that Khafre recut the bedrock surface before he built his causeway on top. Although, this is debated due to a hardened crust on top of the bedrock, which could have acted as natural protection against erosion. But we also know that the Sphinx Temple overlaps masonry from an older phase of the Valley Temple. It's possible that this older phase was simply made in the times of Khufu, and was another structure altogether, maybe involving the harbour in front of the Sphinx. But it is possible it could be even older. At this stage we just don't know. There is also early dynastic, pre-4th dynasty activity at Giza. And yes, technically the Sphinx could be older than the 4th dynasty. It's just that the evidence says that the water erosion often quoted is not a way to prove it. We would need something more. Many geologists don't even think that this is water erosion at all, and they are far more qualified than you or me to make this claim. These are independent geologists, many of which I've had the chance to speak to in the past couple of weeks, and they have no relationship with Egyptology, yet see no geological evidence to assume the Sphinx predates the 4th dynasty. So, over the next few weeks and months, I'll be taking a closer look at the archaeology and structures around the Sphinx, at the specific erosion on the body of the Sphinx itself, and although the water erosion does look to be dynastic in origin, Colin Reader could still be right that the Sphinx once was an early dynastic or late pre-dynastic monument, and the head could simply have been re-carved and masonry added to transform the body into a lion. Houdan says the uniformity of the erosion on the western wall is all because of the redirection of the surface water from the quarries, but this erosion could be a mix of pre- and post-4th dynasty erosion, so we should also take a closer look and maybe do a stronger comparison with the southern wall, which can really only be explained as post cafre in origin. Basically, the western wall could have been eroded before Khufu and Khafre, but the burden of proof is on those that say the erosion is older, because it can be explained in dynastic history. We should also take a closer look at the erosion of the Member 1 limestone wall to the north of the Great Sphinx, because this could well show water erosion that actually is older than dynastic history. I'll make sure I present all the evidence in a future video on the Ancient Architects channel. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.